Hi, this is Pastor Brian Wolfmiller. A few years ago, I wrote a little book called Has American Christianity Failed? And on my YouTube channel, I asked if anybody was using that book for a book study or a Bible study of theirs. Well, my friend Christopher Hogan let me know that their Bible class was using the book, that they had some questions, and in fact, that they were recording the Bible study and they were going to make it available on the internet and as a podcast as well. So that's what you found. The study is about to begin. I hope you enjoy it. Hi, this is Christopher Hogan, and I'd like to thank my friend, Pastor Brian Wolfmiller, for giving me that kind introduction. It was such a blessing. And now I can finally start putting out these Bible classes on YouTube and on Podbean and iTunes and other places. So thanks for joining me. I'm not going to spend too much time on camera at the beginning of each lesson because I want to get straight to the lessons. But I would like to let you know that this class began in early 2019 it's now early 2020 and um, getting around to putting them out there I finally got a cool hey I forgot I have my glasses on I don't really need them <laughs> anyway thanks for joining us or me I always say us when I refer to Cafe Solo but it's really just me thank you for joining me here and uh, remember, as you're watching these Bible studies, to like them and follow us on Facebook, where when one drops there, you'll get notified, and subscribe to us on YouTube, where you have to hit that notification bell, too, and then you'll get notified when one of the next episodes is posted. And you can also subscribe on Podbean if you're listening to this via a uh, podcast streaming service, and on iTunes and possibly others in the very near future. I'm working those details out. Don't want to waste too much time, like I said. I just want to get going. But I want to give you a heads up. In the early part of the class, there's this gentleman who hadn't been in class for a long time, if he'd ever been in class. Uh, I've just found out this morning that I've been teaching the uh, Saturday morning Bible class for eight years. And before that, I was teaching just Sunday morning classes for 12 years and attending Bible class for 20 some years now, 23 years. So uh, there's a long story as to why my attendance in Bible class isn't as long as I am old. We'll save that for another day. So anyway, there's this gentleman who brings up something that he calls the plot, focusing on the plot. So pay attention for that. And then also just listen for some great, great insight from Pastor Wolf Miller as I play some audio clips from him throughout the class. And in future classes, we'll have video clips from Pastor Wolf Miller where he either responded to questions or I found clips of him on the YouTubes in various places to include in the class. So with that said, make sure you share this with friends so that they also can see it, hear it, watch it, enjoy it, be blessed by it. And here's the format. I'm going to have to maximize my screen here and say let's go ahead and get started with that and this is the slide deck that I use during the class so I'm going to run through that as best I can in real time as I play the audio here on this recording and without further ado let's get started with the class I hope it blesses you it blesses me to prepare it and teach it today this is kind of just a verse I pulled out to start us off this people honors me with their lips, but their hearts, their heart, I always put an S in there when I remember it in my head, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching us doctrines, the commandments of men. You leave the commandments of God and hold to the traditions of men. That's from Mark 7. It's kind of interesting because for the last couple of weeks I've had one up there that talked about the tradition of the elders. You know, kind of interesting how we always want to kind of drift off a little bit. Um, it's hard to stay just right there in the lane. Um, so let's go ahead and open with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for gathering us together this morning to be about the study of your word, Lord, and to work through uh, this new study. We uh, are saddened ourselves, Lord, this day that our good friend Dell is not with us, but we are joyful, Lord, that he is with you. And we ask you to comfort us in our loss, and uh, we just look forward to our time, the sure hope we have of 
for the resurrection and eternity that where we'll get to see our good friend Dell again. Bless our time of study, Lord, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. This is the book we're going to be studying for a while. Does anybody ever heard of this book? Gary, without giving away too much, tell us your general first impressions of the book. Um, I, last week, was it last week already? Week two weeks before. ago. Two weeks ago, uh, Chris gave me the first chapter uh, and asked me to read it. Well, I think I wanted to read it. And uh, I read it and I sent it to my brother and he read it. And we both have about the same impression. Um, the Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. But, you know, this is pledge week, so I write a big check. So always the doubt of, am I really a believer? Am I really following uh, Christ? Or, uh, you know, whoever loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. I love my father. How could I? So I'm not worthy of him. Always those doubts come creeping in. And um, this book deals with that. That um, there just seems to be a, a need by the church, every church, to yeah, but. And they put more in it. Uh, yeah, you're saved, but did you Bob, get your kids in Lutheran school? You know what? Mm -hmm. You know you, you doubt that, and that's it's. A, it, he goes way back to Satan. Mm -hmm. what, what Satan's first thing is he created doubt in her. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So that's uh, okay. So you think this will be a worthwhile absolutely thing to work through for me? Okay. I read it, made my wife read it, and I sent it to my brother. <laughs> <laughs> Funny thing, I think I was sitting home that Saturday morning doing something at the kitchen table, or. I was outside. I don't remember. I think I was out on the back patio having my coffee. And all of a sudden, my phone rings, and it's Gary. I'm like, Gary never calls me on Saturday. What's up? And he goes, Mr. Hogan, I've been reading that paper that you gave me. <laughs> so it obviously yeah, impacted, the same morning. It impacted him a little bit to where he had to call. So we're going to start working through the book. Lesson one will be basically examining the characteristics of American Christianity. How might the church in America define the success? I think when I first brought this up a couple weeks ago, Brian asked, you know, well, how do you define failure and how do you define success? Well, the book deals with that. Uh, and how might we determine whether or not we, let alone American Christianity, are succeeding or failing at what the church is called to do? Anybody have any thoughts on that before I play a piece of audio? How might you define the church? I'm going to ask that question on the next page, too. So maybe we'll listen to the audio first. What was your question? How do, we How do you define, How do you define American Christianity? What determines what American Christianity is? Well, there's a lot of discussion about it because there's a bunch of them that like to throw the Mormons into Christianity. How do we know if the church has failed or has been a success? What defines that sort of thing? And I think there's a lot of different answers that the church in America might give to that. Here, look, we've succeeded because look at how huge we are or look at how influential we are in the halls of Congress in Washington, D.C. or look at how many people come to church or how big our budget is or or whatever. How, how big the contemporary Christian music um, genre is and radio and you can judge success all these different ways but I would propose to you that the one way that we have to judge success in the church and in our own uh, Christian thinking is does what we teach match the scriptures are we being faithful to the words of Jesus does what we teach match the scriptures because he listed some great things there right some churches say well we have more numbers than you so we're successful or we have more numbers, period, not necessarily even than anybody else. We just have, look at all the people we have. Or right now with Trump, the evangelicals are going nuts, right? Because they're like, we have the president's ear. He's listening to us. We have influence in the White House. Is that what defines whether the church is successful or not? And he's going to address that a whole bunch. What is nose blindness? Gary knows, but before Gary gives a 
a little feedback. Does anybody know what nose blindness is? You ever seen the Febreze commercials? Yeah. With the big socks and stuff like that? The young man in the dorm room can't smell his socks because he's around them all the time. Right? It's a modern version of you can't see the forest for the trees. Yeah. Um, anybody ever owned a cat? Eventually, you stop being able to smell the litter box, right? I know I did, and I'd have people come over. You know, when Janet and I first started dating, and she's like, what is that? Wait, you have a cat. <laughs> you know? So you have to just kind of stay tuned in to the fact that there's these things. Car odors, your car could have some old thing under the seat, and you get in your car every day. You don't even think about it, but somebody else gets in your car, and you're like, something's not right here. Okay. Um, body odor, dirty socks, stuff like that. They're common everyday things that... Um, your garbage can in your pantry or whatever, you can you can get to the point where you don't smell it, but the first person that walks in the door will, because they're not used to your house. They're used to their stuff that they're nose blind to. Cook, cook some cabbage and see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> cook some fish and boy, boy, or over bacon. I made some bacon like over the holidays. That's a good smell. That's a good smell. <laughs> but Janet walks in and she's like, "What's that smell?" I said, "What smell?" <laughs> That's a great smell, you know. She, but she's like, no, it smells terrible. Well, if we have this nose blindness about everyday stuff, is there such a thing as theological nose blindness? Do we get theologically nose blind? And if so, what does that look like? Gary knows the answer. See, if all had up, y'all need to buy the book. Then we can have these discussions. Study guides online. It is. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I use some of the for the questions. Yeah. Yeah, later. <laughs> but, <laughs> well, if, if nose blindness is like the Febreze commercial where you have these dirty socks around, you know, so what would theological nose blindness kind of look like? False teaching, if you've heard some false teaching. Yeah, you know the, the old saying, you know, um, if you tell a lie often enough, people start to believe it is true. It's that way with theology, too. If, if you hear the same phrase over and over again in the Christian community or the same teaching over and over again in the Christian community, you will be affected by it. Even if you just, I mean, I work real hard at not because I listen to false teaching to get ready to do good teaching, <laughs> but you still are. I still am. And I'm, I'm not immune to, to something sound and right up here, but it's not right in here. I had a good friend in Kingwood that his favorite saying is, it's not a salvation issue. Will you move on? <laughs> Everything's a salvation issue. <laughs> it's all justification. If you can't bring justification into the conversation, then don't have it. Right? Just kidding. Um, it, it's kind of this. It's being so saturated and surrounded by some thoughts and ideas, falsehoods, as Brian said, that we just fail to see them, if we ever did see them as false. Because at first hearing, they could sound so good, right? But they're still at work shaping how we read and understand the Bible. They also shape how we pray and worship, you know? Um, they shape our understanding of God, the world, and our place in the world. I didn't grab the screen, but that's okay. Uh, and we begin to absorb their theology even without noticing it. What's the dominant church body in our area? Not to pick on anybody particularly, just to acknowledge the fact. Check it for us. Baptists. A lot of Baptists. Right? There's also the, a lot of Methodists in the area. How many Lutheran churches are there in the area comparatively? Few. Fewer. Right? So all of our friends and some of our family are going to be absorbing all that stuff, and we're absorbing it too. And then, it's like I've said any number of times, what you constantly feed yourself with is what eventually comes out, especially in the tenser moments of life, the more difficult moments of life. <clears throat> to me, there's another part of that. Uh, we're surrounded by falsehoods, but we don't want to be the light. Mm. Or that's, that, that, that's too harsh. We're hesitant to show the light. Right. So we try to blend in. We try to be blind. Uh, oh, that's good. We you were, don't uh, yeah. vote, right? Pardon? You don't want to rock, rock the boat. I it's was, uh, Lutherans are a unique bunch. 
but I think we're afraid, we're, we're hesitant to, to say we're Lutheran because that might send a connotation off to somebody. But I was... Uh, <laughs> well, we'll close wife, down discussion, if nothing else. Yeah, my wife was, she, she's really big on this one. You know, we, why are we not, why are we not boldly proclaiming we're Lutherans, all right? So, <laughs> we uh, we were driving down Spring Stupor the other day, and here is uh, the Baptist, it's Klein Baptist, Klein North Baptist, which is Champion Forces Satellite, all right? Mm -hmm. Big facility right on Mr. Fox's land. Uh but anyway, uh, so I said, let's see, we have now, we have Klein Methodist, Klein Baptist, Trinity Klein, and uh, I was driving down Kirkendall, and we now have uh, Klein Islamic Center. So, so, so the, the church family of Klein includes the Muslims. And I went, I, I don't think that's real. <laughs> They're just very I, ecumenical. I couldn't pass it up. <laughs> that's all. They're ecumenical. They embrace yeah, all yeah, of it. Sure. Put our name on anything. That's right. Um, but it is interesting because if we don't stop and at least think maybe this is possible, then we're opening ourselves up to being heavily influenced by, you know, what the majority of what's around us, really. I guess uh, I like what Gary said. And I guess the thought of our own the nose blindness that popped into my head is being too distracted <clears throat> by differences amongst the brothers and sisters in Christ as opposed to making an impact on the greater whole, which are non, non-Christ non followers, right? Right. And so if you lose the plot trying to figure out who's right amongst the family, you miss the plot of why our society has gone the way it has. And we've not been present and we've not been present and effective witnesses right. to those who don't know Christ. Yeah, I think Lutherans, like Gary was saying, we, we we tend to shrink back. Whereas our Methodist and Baptist brothers and sisters in Christ, they're a little more bold. Even if they don't say this is what our church teaches. They're teaching what their church teaches because they're saturated in it, and that's what's coming out of them. And we need to be saturated in what we believe. Now, this isn't so that we can say we're better than you uh, because that's one of the problems in the church, if you read the book. Uh, it's not for us to say we're Christian and you're not because that's absolutely not true. It's more to just take a look at the church in general, and that includes the Lutheran church, and say... Do we understand what we believe, why we believe it, and are we willing to be bold enough to step out and say, well, I know that, and, and learn to do it politely and say, I know that, that that's your take on baptism. I know you think that, that you have to be grown up and you have to make a decision and blah, blah, blah. And, and, but, and, and that's, that's, you know, you don't say things like, well, that's okay, because that invalidates their false understanding of baptism. <laughs> but you can say, can I share with you some scripture? Can I take you into the text? And then together, we can kind of just work the text out. Now, if we, if we do that and we come out and you say, see, that still says that baptism is this, and you say, well, I can't get past, you know, 1 Peter 3, you know, I, I just can't get past the fact that it says baptism saves you, and I can't get past the fact that Jesus says there's something is happening in baptism, and if that thing that he says is happening in baptism is happening, why wouldn't I want it, that for my infant? Why would I want to take a chance uh, on waiting until that child is five or ten or whatever, you know? So we just have to believe what we believe and be willing to take that stand in a gentle and respectful way. Maybe we won't change any minds, but you know, maybe I, I we will. Not, that's not, what you just said is not really the point I was making. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. This is not a, I guess, I, I'm saying kind of the focusing on the debate between other Christians on those kinds of things, I believe is missing the plot, because the greater problem is somebody who doesn't know Christ, period. Mm. So the nose blindness comes from worrying about the, you used to call it the, is it a salvation issue or not, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Worrying about that to the point of being, losing the plot and not being an effective witness to a non-believer, period. Okay. Being in the world, but not of the world, and so I, I think that's a bit... When it's I, a little different than what I just said, yeah. It is, and it's, it's worried less about the debates amongst other Christians. <coughs> and it's worried, we should be right. worried more about those who don't know Christ, period. So is that Satan's plan to say, if I get them arguing amongst themselves about 
non-salvation issues. Absolutely. Well, except the fact that the Bible says... See, except... And I, I'm not disagreeing with you because I think we should be focused on the... Um, the ones who haven't heard the salvation story, <laughs> uh, or they've heard it and they just don't haven't heard it correctly. So it still comes down to whether we know what we know and believe what we believe and are willing to share what we share. It's just if we do limit it to arguing on Facebook, we're going to um, be kind of like not spinning our wheels, but we're very not likely to convince a Calvinist to not be a Calvinist on Facebook. The Calvinist is going to be convinced to not be a Calvinist if he actually gets into a Lutheran Bible study. <laughs> Maybe, I don't know. <laughs> but um, Because there's, they have very strongly, deeply held beliefs. Now, if you can get, and I've said this how, how many times now, when you want to invite somebody to get to know the faith, sometimes the least best place you can take them is to the worship service. The best place you can take them is to a Bible study where the Bible study says, here's what we believe and why we believe it. They can then go, oh, that's a bunch of bunk. Or they can go, hmm, I'm going to think about that. And that is more likely to have an effect on the unbeliever than trying to figure out why we stand and sit and you know do all this other stuff, which you have to then explain to them later. So have them come to a Bible class and have them really understand the scriptures, right? Then you got to explain to them it's not going to happen this week. It's going to happen over time. Because if you come into a class, certain classes, for one week, you're going to be in a situation where you're going to be like, um, that sounded like they were just hammering everybody. Well, we're not hammering everybody for the sake of hammering everybody. We're, we're just looking at how we differ a little bit and why we believe what we believe. And can we, can we embrace that? Somebody said, you know, can we really embrace who we really are? To the point where we're not afraid to share it with people, believers and unbelievers. Right? The last line says we begin to absorb their theology without ever noticing. Right. Some of the theology out there is damning. Yes. I mean, so you, yes. You, you've got to know what you believe. You just said yeah. it. You got to know what you believe. Yeah. And not be. And it's okay. Yeah. The Bible says there have to be divisions <clears throat> among us, and that means divisions among the body of Christ, not necessarily divisions among. Christians and unbelievers, because the purpose of that is that the truth will come to the surface, because we'll get together and we'll, you know, state our positions and work it through in the text. This reminds me of the story of the frog. Put a frog in um, tap water and, and yeah. then put a bunch of burner underneath, and yeah. the yeah. water will get warm and put it in hot, and the frog won't even notice. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, next thing you know, it's just a dead frog. But um, we're going to move on. But but the idea being <laughs> that um, <clears throat> let's say, for instance, you you stop. You never go to Bible study in a, in your Lutheran church, or you rarely go to service in your Lutheran church. But you have lots of friends who are from unbelievers to. Methodists to Catholics to Baptists to Episcopalians to Presbyterians, and they're not going to shrink back from, if they're going to church on a regular basis and being fed on a regular basis, from expressing, however they express it, what they believe. But you're not going to be grounded in what you believe. I mean, you could read the Book of Concord, which you should. <laughs> That'll give you, because it always says, we, we believe, teach, and confess blah, 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 about God. We believe, teach, and confess this about um, sin. We believe and teach this about baptism. It, that's what the Book of Concord does, and it does it because other Christians at that time had differing opinions about those things. And most of them still do. So, um, Let's see. So what is American Christianity? We still haven't quite come up with a definition yet, right? I thought it's a lot of different denominations. It's a lot of stuff, right. <clears throat> and you have to be honest with it and say they are, I, I give everybody credit for wanting to share the gospel and wanting to um, have more souls saved. But how do they do it? And do they have a positive effect or a negative effect or a neutral effect? That kind of thing, you know? Um 
get into mm-hmm. lots of weedy discussions. You know, well, you know, yeah, they they just got out five percent of the truth amongst their ninety percent of falsehoods, but that's enough to save somebody. So leave them alone. At least that has in that question it has the word Christianity. Mm-hmm. I mean, you could say, uh, what are American churches? Because there's so many different churches that don't have Christ in their church. There are a lot of Christian churches that don't have Christ in their church. Well, you know what I'm saying. (laughs) Within the text itself. Yeah. yeah. But we're talking about Christianity. American Christianity started somewhere, right? Where did American Christianity start? It wasn't started with the Lutherans. We came much later. It started with the Methodists, right? So does American Christianity refer to a specific denomination? Absolutely not. Lutherans would be included in that um, along with everybody else. So how can we determine what it is? To move forward, I think we have to have some sense of what defines American Christianity. So then we can look at what does it take to be successful at being a Christian in America versus maybe failing. So we can look at a few broad theological trends that exist in the church and uh, that reach into the American church across denominations. And in one way or another, they draw the church's attention away from Jesus and his words of comfort and life. And it's hard to think about this. It, It honestly is. It's hard for me to think about it that, you know, some of my friends who are Christian and they go to churches that are Christian churches, they're hearing messages that aren't just jamming them towards Jesus, if you will. Um, You know, it's just the way that it's working in America, at least. We get American Christianity, and I guess we came across it in Kansas when I was working for a church up there, the DCE, um, as a youth group, and parents were coming in, and and they were CEOs, Christmas and Easter only, and then mm-hmm. because their kids started come, wanting to come regular, they came regular, and, right. and these parents would come to this DCE and says, okay, give me, I'm a suburbanite, give me a list of what i got to do to please God so I know I'll be going to heaven. Yeah. I, want, I want a list that I can check off. Mm-hmm. And she said she would tell them it doesn't work that way. <laughs> but I'm, a, I'm an American Christian, I'm a suburbanite, give me a list. Yep. No, no. How many times a year do I have to go to church yep. to be a Christian? To please God. Yeah, to please God. Even if it's just to please God, yeah, not to say to be saved, but just to say to make God happy, kind of a thing. Yeah. And then the, uh, you see Americans going abroad to share the word, <clears throat> and they use worldly values to build relationships. For example, water for life goes over to India. And they have engineers that go over there and dig water wells and, and mm-hmm. bring pure water to, to the village. And then the chief says, this is a great thing. I says, what else you got to share with me? We got Jesus to share with you. Okay, I believe now, baptize me. And all my people, you understand, believe in Jesus now and be baptized. And, and so they're using worldly values. Mm-hmm. I I want something for myself too. I want you to prove that you're my friend, and then I'll listen to what you have to say. Ninety eight percent of the world operates on the basis I don't care what you say until I know that you care. Yeah, we're going to talk about that in many weeks from now. But we're going to talk we, about. We could even look at the uh, school that we started over in Nairobi. So yeah. we're we're taking orphans in, helping them with their day to day issues of loving and sharing Jesus with them. So I guess the, the this class for the first few weeks is going to seem a little bit harsh because it's going to talk about these isms that uh, influence the church, but it's also then going to talk about just kind of the right way to kind of approach things as the book goes. You know, the book isn't just like... So don't get scared just because the first couple of weeks seem like that. It's it's so hard to, to, looking make, honestly to pin at things. it down because... Um, there's just a lot going on in Christianity. There are some who, you give me an example, when I was a youth director here, it was all about sports. All about sports. Mm-hmm. Uh, every church, we had a spring Christian athletic league, all the churches out here, we all played together, you know, it, it was all high school, youth kind of stuff, and uh, it was 
It's all about sports. Now, no sports at all. Now it's all about music. You know, it's it it, it evolves into what's what's hot now or what's popular now. So it's hard to say what is American Christianity. It's a it's a hodgepodge of a lot of stuff. Yeah, it's a really, really is a worldly value to draw people into a relationship, whether it's sports or now music, mm -hmm. yeah, or something else, or a, a well, a water well. And it's not bad. And it's also God's design. You can read the Bible on that basis, and you know, I, I design you to desire relationships with each other. And that relationships, I want you to build those relationships, but don't fail to share the message, the gospel right. message. With Which you. we've talked about before is one of the issues that the church faces is, and I even remember here at our own church, but I've, I've seen it in lots of other churches, is, you know, you have to wait until you've established a relationship to a certain level before you dare share the word of God with them. Well, why? Let's ask some hard questions. Why do I have to wait to share the word of God with anybody. Because we think in worldly terms, we think if I share it without being their buddy, if I share it without having this relationship with them, they'll just immediately dismiss it. But you can't find that in scripture. Scripture is all about people who just kind of go up to people and share the word with them, right? They go up, people know that they're going to be talking. They're a prophet. They're, a, you know, whatever, an apostle, and people show up to hear that. And then Jesus gives his John 6 sermon, very hard, <laughs> you know. You come here because your bellies are getting filled. But I'm going to tell you a hard truth, and most of the people leave. The form was a prayer yesterday. Did anybody read it? Mm -hmm. yeah, there you go. Glad we sent that booger out. <laughs> but uh, it's talking about why am I here? You know, have you ever walked in a room and you go, What's I supposed to get? Or why did I come in here? You know, he, he turned it over to the church. You know, you walk in a church and you go, okay, why am I here? What are you? What am I here for? What am I? What am I wanting to get? You know, if it's only what pleases my ears, then I'm coming in for the wrong reason. Right. I'm a work in progress. I'm a field to be tilled. So plant a seed, and, and sometimes you got to jerk something out too. You know, it's a... so. What we're going to be talking about are the things that have influenced how we, what we think should be happening in a church service versus maybe what really should be happening in a church service, or in our church, our Christian life and things like that. And they're just hard questions. They're things we have to be able to to wrestle with a little bit, and and see maybe where these things started, and say. We can either say, oh, that doesn't affect us. We do things totally differently, which is probably a lie. And then, or we could say, you know, yeah, you know, if we're honest, that, that's even in my life and, and in my church and in my, uh, you know, relationships and stuff like that. And what's the purpose behind doing that? To just try and do more of what the Bible says we're supposed to do, right? Not to look down on other people other than saying, hey, maybe we can help them see that this, this, and this kind of start pulling you away from Christ, and this, this, and this actually move you closer to Christ. And wouldn't you want to rather be closer to Christ than farther away from Christ? And most people would say, oh, of course I want to be closer to Christ. That's why I'm doing this other stuff. And they go, well, let's look at that stuff. You know? So a little bit of audio. You kind of look out at uh, the broad swath of American Christianity, uh, and you see all sorts of different things. I mean, all sorts of craziness uh, out there in the church, in worship, in, in Christian bookstores, in um, all, when you when you listen to pre preaching uh, and teaching on the radio and on television. And uh, there's a huge and wide variety of that. So the question of what is American Christianity is is a is first a pondering question. And I think that that kind of leads us then to the into the first topic. What, what is this thing? If you want to evaluate it, what is it? And can we define? Because if you think about it, some people's first impression of American Christianity is when they turn on TBN or Daystar, or when they walk into a Lifeway bookstore and they see the books that are there. That's their impression of Christianity. Are you willing to stand up with them and say, yes, Benny Hinn, you know, Kenneth Copeland, um, whoever, these people represent my Christianity? 
because I guarantee you this, those people are going to have, if, if we stay silent, those people are going to win. So why should we speak up? Not to be out there constantly slamming people, but to be out there constantly spreading the truth about what Scripture said. If somebody says, oh, if you just send $100, and not, somebody who's not a Christian, who wants to be a Christian maybe, or is considering being a Christian maybe, might say, oh, if I just send these people $100, then I'm good to go. And I'll get all these you know, health, wealth, and prosperity, whatever. No. I hate to tell this to you, but it doesn't work that way. <laughs> Are we willing to say those hard things? Because I have a, I have a very hard time going up to people, you know, in public and saying that's wrong. I've tried it a few times. It doesn't. They don't receive it very well, even if I've known them for ten or fifteen years, because they're stuck. And that's what one of the things that Pastor Wolfmiller, who's all the audio from, one of the things that he brings up it ties to something Gary said is. It's not so much that we don't have the truth. It's just that they also have their truth. They're stuck in something. And we have to be aware that they're stuck in something. Because that's the first thing we're going to run into when we try and share a different understanding of the scriptures with them, is their stuckness. And they could say the same thing right back at us. Well, I'm trying to convince you that, you know, the Lord's Supper is just a symbolic act, and you're stuck in your Lutheranism. <laughs> you know. Well, then we're not going to get anywhere. You know. So we have to be able to go to the text. I had this discussion with Pastor the other day. I said, I said, I said, to me, it's all about going back to the text. Take if you can get somebody to, to go into the text with you and read the text with you, then you can just hand it over to God and say, well, they may have a different understanding. You know. Anyway, the comment that we made earlier about let's not worry about denomination, let's just worry about keep it. Pastor Nowak always said, it, keep the main thing the main thing. Mm -hmm. All right. So, what's the danger of just uh, backing off and not not trying to establish differences <coughs> to uh, uh, make sure they understand that they know Jesus? What's the problem with that? What Jesus do they know? What Jesus do you want them to know? There is a Jesus, and he's the Jesus of the Bible. But there's also a dozen or more false Jesuses out there floating around. And do we want to introduce them to the right Jesus or the wrong Jesus? That's why we're in Bible study, is to learn about the real Jesus, right? And to share that Jesus with people. Not the Santa Claus Jesus, right? Did Satan know Jesus? Yeah. yeah. So, what is useful? This is the I've question. I've got another point on that. I, I pondered it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry. But the point is, uh, it's awfully hard to sell something that you don't really believe in. If you're a good salesman and you believe you sell Chevrolets and you believe Chevrolets is the best, best thing since sliced bread, you're going to be successful selling it. If you're selling Chevrolets and you really believe that a Ford is better, right. uh, it's awfully hard to sell. And I really think that's the danger of, of barely uh, just 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 teach Jesus. Right. You've got to teach Jesus why, Jesus who, Jesus how. And uh, that, I think, is where um, I see people who become believers and then quickly fall away. Uh -huh. You know, I, I, as a, working in the school here for so many years, I would see people who, who come because their their kids are in school here, and yeah, they, they, they like it, you know, but the second those kids are graduating, they're gone, and never step foot in the church again. And how, what did we what did we miss? Uh, or what didn't get taught? Or what, um, how, why didn't we reach them? I mean, they were here for eight years, some of them, and still just, well, you never know. And the honest truth is they could have been in Bible study every week for eight years and still walked away when their kids walked away because they weren't here for that. You know, But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't have Bible studies just because people will walk away from it. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't teach the truth just because people won't listen to it. right? And, and one of the big things that's not new, but it's coming around again, is this notion of 
well, I'm not a Baptist, I'm a Christian. I'm not a Methodist, I'm a Christian. I'm not a Lutheran, I'm a Christian. Well, the reason that there are Methodists and Baptists and Presbyterians and Episcopalians and Lutherans and Catholics is because we have things that we differ on. We think when the Bible says you should baptize infants, that it, that, that baptism saves. There aren't that many other Christians out there that believe that. And when we say the Lord's Supper is the, the body and blood of Christ, there aren't that many other Christians out there that believe that. And those are the two biggies, right? We believe that the pastor has the uh, calling, the, the, the uh, vocation, the office of forgiving sins. So when he stands up in front of the congregation and says, in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins, we believe that, or we're supposed to, that that's Christ's forgiveness being given to us through the pastor, through the office of the keys. Most other Christians don't believe that. They think the pastor's just like a, a, some kind of leader you know, or something. So there are differences. It doesn't make our, 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 our friends non-Christians because they believe in the triune God. They believe that Jesus died for their sins. They believe those things that saved them. But there are differences. And they're going to share their differences. I've been around it a lot when we were going through all the stuff we were going through. And everybody came in wanting to share their version of Christianity, their American Christianity. And it became a battle. You know? Pastor Rick Warren, in California, large denominational, non denominational pastor, he made a comment that I really believe is true. He says, You've got to know what you believe, otherwise, you're a fall for anything. True. He said, So our job as a church is to teach you what you need to know concerning the scriptures. Right. That's their job. And I, I, I think that's that's a powerful, powerful statement. He also said, No creed but the Bible. Yeah, I know he does. <laughs> but he's true because. Yeah. And I've said, I'll say this boldly. If you want to be a member of the Baptist Church, learn what they believe and believe what they teach. Mm -hmm. But be open to having discussions with your fellow Christians. If you want to be a Methodist, learn what they believe. Because if you don't, if you're just there because it's a social club, you know, I don't really know what their church believes. I just like to go there on Sunday morning and be around my buddy. You know, Well, you're learning what they believe one way or the other. So is it useful to take a look at these characteristics and trends that make up and influence American Christianity? Well, Jesus wills that his church will deliver the true comfort of the gospel. If it's not being delivered somewhere, that's a problem. Not necessarily our problem, though. We can just shrink back and, and, and not address it. Or we can say, here's what Jesus really wants to deliver in his church to his people. Right? These characteristics take the focus off of Christ generally as I think Gary's noticed when he read the first chapter, and they put the focus on the Christian. One of the sayings that I just love is that this is not about you in the strictest sense of, of being about you. It's for you. It's about Jesus dying for you. It's about Jesus rising for you. It's about God's plan of salvation for you. It's a little different than saying it's about you. Because if it's about you, you'll read it totally differently. You'll become a Daniel. You'll become a Peter. You'll become a whatever. And that's some of the stuff that's creeped into the church over time. Quick thoughts before we move on? Same thing's true of a worship service. Is it about me or is it for me? Yeah. It's, I, it's really not even for me. It's to help me worship Christ. But we turn it into... Oh, I'm not being fed. I'm not coming back. Right. Or I didn't feel right when the service was over, so it, couldn't, it didn't work for me. As opposed to, did I go there and hear the word? Did God, was it for me? Did God come to me in his word? Did God come to me in his sacraments? Yes, he did. Did you respond in thanksgiving and praise to him? Yes, I did. No matter how you feel. It happened. Yes, by the neighbors in Kansas City where we lived in Olathe at that time. He was Methodist and she was Baptist, so he went to her church uh, a couple Sundays, and then they came back, and he told told his wife, "I feel so dirty when I go to church at the Baptist. <laughs> Let's go over to the Methodist. Yeah. I feel better when we're over there." Yeah, because the Baptist church preaches fire and brimstone, and the Methodist church is a little different. 
So there are six isms that we're going to talk about over the next few weeks after Rudy says what he's going to say. During this last week, we heard some other <coughs> groups in the March of Life, and uh, everybody knew what the Lutherans believed if they heard it. In other words, they, they wore ca uh, caps just like this color, oh. and they had a, the name of the Redeemer Lutheran Church or whatever on it. And then Pastor Harrison led the group in singing in Mighty Fortress. And then after that, they said to pray, I believe in God the Father and so on, and the Lord's Prayer. Right. And so people who heard it, and even the ones who were there, they knew what the Lutherans believed, and Dr. Seltz also was there. Yeah. And he also gave a good witness to whoever heard him. So, uh, yeah. And I watched a little bit of that online. It was really cool. I wish I'd been there, the VC mark. But let's say, okay, put this in a, a, a context of the Lutherans are at the March for Life. The Catholics are at the March for Life. You're not going to find, you're going to find some similarities there, right? Those Catholic kids. Uh, then you have your Methodists and your Presbyterians, and, and they're all pro-life, right? So that's something we can come together on, except maybe the liberal side of some of those denominations. Maybe they're not as pro-life. Uh, even the liberal side of the Catholic Church, apparently, uh, has the Catholic Church are right next to the yeah. and they ask Pastor so, uh, you're, you're here together. Yeah. What about your beliefs? And and instead of saying that we we are opposed uh, this idea that the Catholics have and so on, he said we're all together right. on. This is an issue where we're all together. We're all on the issue. So if a non-believer is there and they look at it, depending upon what they hear, they might hear a slightly different thing. Like, but they, they'll, they'll see, well, here's some unity, right? So they're all the same. On some things, we are. Yeah. And we should, we should embrace that. Um, but... Here's some isms that shape and define the Christian church. One of them is revivalism. Another is pietism. Another is mysticism. Another is enthusiasm. Another is legalism. And another one is moralism. Okay? Generally, although you could probably find some exceptions, if you put ism at the end of something, it's not always the best thing. <laughs> Um, but we're going to look particularly at the top four because the book addresses those. But um, but the bottom two aren't things to ignore either. And we're going to define each of them in the coming weeks. Um, what do we know ab about these? What do these mean? Anybody know what any of those six mean? Because we're going to talk about them. Yeah, I got all the answers. Right you now. have all the answers because you've read the book. <laughs> oh, yeah. Or you've read the study yeah. guide. I've read the study guide. <laughs> yeah, wolfmuller.com. Uh, dot co, not dot com. Uh, dot co. Yeah. yeah. Not dot com. Oh, well, dot co. Um, <laughs> what does Jesus say in Matthew eleven twenty eight to 30? He says, come to me, all you who are... All who labor. labor. Thank you. Come <laughs> to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So... How can we apply that to how we think about the church or about Christianity? Is Christianity supposed to be wearisome? Is that, doesn't that fit what he just said about when he went to the Baptist church and came home feeling dirty? I think so, yeah. Is it, is, there was no rest for his soul there. Yeah, and even if it doesn't happen right away, you might eventually feel weary instead of uh, relieved. You might feel burdened instead of uh, relieved. Um, because American Christian, how does American Christianity score? And it's going to sound harsh, but bear with us. How does American Christianity score regarding this? Well, American Christianity generally fails because its yoke is wearisome and its burden is heavy. And what does that mean? That its yoke is is wearisome and its burden is heavy. What's the church doing? The American Christian Church doing to its followers, its believers, whatever, that would be considered wearisome and burdensome, generally. 
it's something Lutherans kind of make a big deal about not doing. <laughs> well, suppose I'm a, a widow living on my husband's pitiful pension. The church is needing money, and a guy stands up and says, I'm going to give a million dollars. How do I feel? Well, you feel great. Good for him. I can't do that. I would like to do that. So I, what's wrong with me? How come I'm not able to do that? Yeah, if I can only give $100, but this other person can give $100,000, am I less of a Christian? I mean, there's thoughts that pop yeah, into people's heads. Yeah, dollars isn't going to do squat. Yeah. The widow's mite comes into mind there. Um, but there's something that it's doing. These isms, really, are things that the American Christian Church, which influences the Lutheran Church, too, are doing that are placing burdens on people that don't belong there. And they're, they're going to wear people out, and people are going to get tired of it. And they're either going to go one of two ways. This is uh, goes way back in, in church history, this thought. But it goes one of two ways. Either you say, I'm doing it, and you're prideful. Or you say, I can't do all that stuff the church wants me to do. And you get into despair. So you're usually on one end of that pendulum. Most people aren't right fairly in the middle where they say, you know, uh, I don't have to do anything to be saved, but I want to do stuff. And when I don't do it, I just repent and I, I ask for forgiveness. And they live more of a quote-unquote Lutheran life. Most people live on one extreme or the other. I'm either proud of all the stuff I'm doing, or I'm despairing because I'm not doing enough. That's American Christianity, those extremes. Lutheranism and some others. Uh, are a little more down the middle. And I would say, based on some studies I've been doing, that when you look at the old school denominations, you know, from way back, they were much more aligned on some of the stuff. And it's only in like the last 100 to 200 years that things have changed. Well, when did America start? A couple hundred years ago, right? So something started happening. So let's take a look at close at these trends uh, with emphasis on the first four. Uh, because like many things, once we know them by name, just look at them, be honest about them, then we'll see them everywhere influencing churches, teachers, and even ourselves. Now, that's not to start climbing up on that ladder of I'm better than these other Christians. You know, Keep that in mind over the course of this study. It's not to say... You know, because everybody will say, oh, well, you think you're perfect because you're a Lutheran? No, I'm not. Because I'm a Lutheran, I know I'm not perfect. How about that? I know that I fall short uh, of the glory of God and I sin daily and, and all these things. Whereas some of these other churches actually put the burden of being sinless on their people. That's a thing I just recently came really face to face with, was having a discussion with somebody when we were talking about original sin yeah i believe that there, we had original sin i also when i was baptized i believe that my sins were washed away so i don't sin every day i only sin sometimes and when i do finally get around to sinning then i'll ask for repentance or i'll, I'll ask for forgiveness rather than the lutheran approach which is even your best deeds are like filthy rags and you're a poor miserable sinner well that's just too harsh you can't Christian people can't walk around like that all day. It doesn't make you sad. It doesn't make you miserable all day long, because you know you're forgiven. You know, there's a joy that comes with that, as opposed to the extremes of pride and despair that come sometimes with the other. You know, so um, revivalism. Let's just define it before we end the class, and then we'll pick up here next week. Why, why does the church look different than it used to look for hundreds and hundreds of years? I think the, the driving force behind that is revivalism, uh, which is unique to the United States, although we've been able to export revivalism very effectively throughout the world. But it's definitely uh, a, a kind of a, a U.S. phenomenon, especially in the history of the church. Is that true? Yeah. yeah. Um, so what is revivalism? It's basically based on Finney's new measures in the Anxious Pension. Many, many moons ago, I brought up the idea of the Anxious Pension. You're all like, well, what's that? I've never heard of the Anxious Pension. Just think about the name. 
somebody goes and sits on the anxious bench, why are they there? Because they're stressed out that day? No, not really. Because they, the people that put him there, want him to, you know, get anxious about something. So. Well, the the main thing, and I mean, just to kind of walk through it historically, uh, we talk about in the history of American Christianity two great revivals: uh, the first Great Awakening and the second Great Awakening. The first Great Awakening was, uh, and the and the key figures for those are on the first hand we have Jonathan Edwards. And then on the second, we have this fellow named Charles Finney. Now, Jonathan Edwards was a Calvinist, then, but but he would travel around and preach, and people kind of kept this model. You would go into town, and you would have a revival service, and, and people would come out, and they'd, they'd come and listen. And they had the camp meetings. This is where the, the origin of the camp meetings. Well, a, a, a century and a half or so after the First Great Awakening, uh, this character, uh, Charles Finney, comes on the scene, and he starts to reproduce that, and, and it causes what's called the Second Great Awakening. Now, Finney was not a, a, a Calvinistic theologian, although his theology had Calvinistic origins. Uh, he, he was a, really his own sort of animal. And, uh, and he invented uh, what he himself called the new measures. He has this, and I, I think it's really quite shocking quotation. Um, it's a stunning, really where he says something like, baptism was good for the apostles, but it doesn't work anymore. So we've got to come up with new ways to get people into the Christian church in our day that are effective. Hmm. And so he sets aside baptism, and he, he uh, invents, he's, he's kind of working on this the whole his whole uh, career, what, what is most effective. And, and in fact, maybe it's helpful to pause there, and to ask, should the church be act, asking the question, what is most effective? Hmm. Um, I, I mean, probably that question is wrong. We should be asking, well, what did Jesus say? But Finney was asking, what's the most effective? And so he invented, he invented things like the anxious bench, where when people were um, troubled by their sins during the sermon, they would come forward to the anxious bench. That's the precursor to the modern altar call. He, uh, he spoke of uh, giving your life to Christ, uh, having a moment of dedication. And, that, and so that, um, that, which is the, kind of the key mark of the beginning of the Christian life for most of American Christianity, that all comes from Charles Finney. And Finney uh, and his revival uh, services going around and having these big kind of camp meetings and tent meetings and calling people out and having these, these week-long things where people would manifest their faith and all sorts of crazy um, emotional experiences. In fact, F Finney talks about the role of the emotions in the faith and how uh, for too long the church has ignored it and that the preacher should focus on it. So these highly emotional, emotionally charged services with music and strong preaching and hell and, and damnation preaching is how it's often characterized. This comes to the church from Finney. Now, what, what I think is really interesting is that, that that model, that revivalistic model, even when Finney was doing it, was not how every service would go. Those were special things where the preacher came in and everyone kind of gathered under the tent for a week to hear the preaching. But then you'd go back to your church and you'd do the order of service or the liturgy or whatever you're used to doing. But most of American Christianity has taken up that tent meeting model, that revival model, and, and made their Sunday services look like that. So that the, one of the chief marks of American Christianity is every Sunday morning in most uh, churches, people are being invited to receive Christ as their Lord and Savior. They're being talked about, they're, they're being talked to that they would make a decision for Christ. They're in fact being invited down to, to, to raise, to close their eyes, to raise their hand, to come down the center aisle and accept Jesus. And that is a direct influence of Charles Finney and revivalism. Is any of that sin? Is any of that sin? Any what he was preaching sin? Finney? Yeah. I think there was a focus on his methodology. Yeah, yeah we're not talking yeah. about that. That was not my question. My question is, is anything he preached that we heard sin? So, well, if, it, if, it, if it worked for 
one person, was it all worth it? Trying to keep my opinion out of it. <laughs> yeah. um, well, I, my, my, my opinion is that um, my comfort level is that I don't like that. But is it sin? And if it, if it worked, then... Um, well, I think you have to ask a qu other question. Sometimes it's a matter of asking the right question. Okay. Um, does the person who does that, what do they walk away believing, right? Because it's not like a baptism. If they go to a baptism, and it's a baptism that's done the right way in the name of the Father, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, because that's an act of God, it's a valid baptism. No matter whether it's done in the Baptist Church, the Methodist Church, the Presbyterian Church, the Episcopalian Church, the whatever. But the church has to believe that the Trinity is the Trinity. So you couldn't do a valid baptism in the Mormon Church because they don't believe in the Trinity. All right? So any Christian church that baptizes in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is a valid baptism. So that's because that's an act of God. What we're talking about in this situation is. Uh, they're being led to an act of man. They're being led to an act of their own will, making a decision. Well, might be that following the decision, they get baptized. If they get baptized in the triune name, then God comes to them, not them going to God. So that well, would be. I guess to Gary's point, the Holy Spirit could be working in the monks at congregation. Yeah. The Holy Spirit could be affecting that one soul at that one time and. So well, how does the how does the how does the Bible want us to think about the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit works? I'm not trying to disagree, but I'm just again we got to start challenging some of of what we are exposed to and try and see if there's anything there. And if it's there, then it's there. And if it's not there, then it's not there. Um, so, what does the Bible say the purpose of the Holy Spirit is and how the Holy Spirit works? All gathered and lightened and sanctified. Yeah. Right. Through, Paul, yeah, through, through, like, through the, word the, the word and the sacraments, sure. right? So, if in the course of this revival, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to work it out. If in the course of more of a revivalistic style service, they actually preach the word, you know, but then, you know, it, that's when we got to kind of step back a little bit and say we can't decide for that person if the Holy Spirit convicted them enough, right? We can't say that, right? We just can't. But what we have to just look at is God has a way of doing his, he wants the church to work. Uh, and we got to look at whether we're getting closer to that or farther away from that. I, I just, my take on the audio is that this is a this is a personality that a subset of the American Christianity includes this kind of revivalism what if focus. Right. Yeah. So it's kind of just yeah. It's kind of just making a characterization of our of the American okay. Christianity and that's a subset has this feature of personality. One of the things he said that I heard was that Finney basically said Baptism is old school. And if, if Finney's belief is that baptism is old school, then he is be, we could risk saying he's denying the baptismal regeneration is a thing. He's a false prophet. He's kind of the he's a and then he's prophet. a false prophet. He is, because Jesus said, go in there for a He didn't say this until you get to the 1800s and you're doing yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. See, I, so it, this, this driving of people to, you know, uh, God in a certain way, you could say the well if it, if it just saves one person, then it's 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 worth it, right? Well, how many people is it harming? We has another question to ask. How many people are being harmed by that versus how many one person is being saved by that? See, I think that if sin enters in, sin enters in not at that point. It in forget the baptism thing. The the come down and and, and sit on the repentant bench or whatever, anxious bench. The sin comes in that on July 7th of 2002, I saved myself. Right. Because I made a decision to call Christ, and that's where the false doctrine comes. And that's, that's where the sin is. We'll talk more about that because, next week, yeah. Because I felt 
so strong I had to walk front and now I'm safe. Right. Not necessarily. Yeah. Well, and I've had to have this discussion with people before too. Yes. The fact that you could say I walked down because of my own decision or you could look at it more honestly and say, well, you wouldn't even have wanted to walk down if God hadn't been working in you through the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Hmm? So, Later. so your thinking is right that, you know, the person who, they, they totally misunderstand Christianity. They, they think Christianity is a matter of their will, a matter of their decision to become a Christian. And the Bible speaks totally the opposite of that, that we cannot and do not come to God of our own will. God comes to us and saves us. Whether that can happen in the course of a emotionally driven, you know, born to move <laughs> worship service, I don't know. Uh, let's maybe end this page, uh, if you'll bear with. So what does revivalism teach? Revivalism teaches that the Christian life begins with a personal decision to accept Christ. So if you think that your Christian life began when you put something, your name in the back of a Gideon Bible, or you, you know, walk down an altar, I would just say, no, it didn't. It probably started while you were sitting in that chair. Take it back to God. Keep driving them to God. God is the one who called you. You didn't have to walk down there to be saved. Right? So there's the Gideon Bibles thing. Multiple, some people go into this mode of multiple acceptances where they think, well, every time I just feel a certain way, I have to rededicate myself. You know, and some people even get rebaptized because they want to have that again and again and again. And the colleges, a lot of them out there are very influenced by the Methodist Church, so they teach a lot of this stuff, and they teach about the spiritual laws which have to do with decision theology, making a decision for Christ. And Pastor Noack one time, very clearly told me, he said, just run as far as you can from decision theology. It's just stay away from it. Uh, push people to salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. Uh, and not of yourself. Let's finish the verse. Not of yourself, lest any man should boast. It's a gift of God. It's a gift of God, right? And so you have extended periods of music, one song after another after another, uh, designed especially to appeal to the emotions. And then you have preaching of the same. You, maybe you have an expository sermon. In the revival, in the revivals, you didn't. Uh, you wouldn't, uh, especially during the Second Great Awakening, it wasn't expository preaching. But, but you know, when you're going to do it week after week after week, you got to settle into a rhythm. So normally you have some expository preaching. But then the main thing is the appeal, where you appeal to people to... Uh, to, to to some call to action, to accept Christ, to rededicate your life to Christ, to um, to to uh, say the sinner's prayer, and all of this. And again, uh, those changes all come straight from Finney. So we can thank Charles Finney for much of the influence on American Christianity, and you can see it, you can smell it now, maybe a little bit as you I can smell a lot, you know. Um, it even happens in every denomination, right? It happens where we think, oh, we have, in order to get people, in order to keep people, we have to do X, Y, or Z. Um, so for many Christians, their testimony basically becomes about them and not about Christ. It becomes about the moment they made a decision based on whatever is going on in their life. It could be that they have to share with you their particular nasty sins. I used to be an alcoholic. I used to be a womanizer. I used to be this. I used to be that. And then Jesus came and saved me. And so it's about, it's not that it, it's totally wrong, you know, because they're getting Christ saving them in there, but it's about that moment that they decided as opposed to the moment that Christ chose them. And it seems like drawing a fine line, but it's really not, because one's biblical and one's not. That's why they have problems with baptism, because it has, it's a God thing. It's God doing it. And they yeah. want to, they want a hands-on thing. They want to be able to say, okay, I, that's, that's why they go back and do it again and again, because it's, I got to be doing something. Right. It's, it's a... And the other, <clears> thing, <throat> the other thing is, is that it also includes the overflow of works of it. I have to tell you all the good stuff I've done since I, I gave my life to Christ, you know, kind of stuff. Well, it's, you're putting a focus in the wrong direction, right? 
So what do some who put the emphasis on their decision say? They say things like, if you don't know when you decided for Christ, how do you know you're a Christian? And Lutherans would say, when I was baptized. Or when, as an adult, when the Holy Spirit... It's like the, the Ethiopian. How, you know, now, he, he didn't say... He wasn't asked to make a decision for Christ. He heard the word and was moved, etc., etc. Uh, so what do some who hear Lutheran preaching say? Uh, I liked your sermon, but when are you going to preach the gospel? Why would they say that? Because for most of American Christianity, the decision for Christ is considered to be the gospel. The altar call is considered to be the gospel, as opposed to the real gospel. And this Brian Wolf Miller guy, he, he shares a story of, of, of something that happened with his wife where somebody actually asked, or him, he was preaching somewhere and some non-Lutherans were there and they came up to him afterwards and they said that. They said, I liked your sermon, Pastor Wolf Miller, but when are you going to preach the gospel? And he's like, I'm pretty sure I did. <laughs> you know? Oh, well, but you didn't, you know, didn't ask anybody to make a decision. Yeah. <laughs> so he's like, no, I preach the gospel. I preached Christ crucified. I preached, you know, law and gospel, and, and they don't hear it that way. That's their blindness, if you will. That they're not hearing that as the gospel. They're they're saying, well, if you don't if you don't give them something to do, if you don't have them make a decision of some kind, then you you haven't preached the gospel. So they're redefining, I guess, what gospel means, right? Uh, revivalism assumes lots of things about the human will. It assumes the human will has some degree of freedom in spiritual matters, and it has none. It has freedom of will in earthly matters, what to wear, where to work, where to live, but it, you, the human will has plays no role in being saved. Right? It's a slave to righteousness. It's a slave to Christ. So why then? This is why the preaching aims their preaching aims to excite and move and appeal to the will because they think the will plays a role in deciding to be saved, as opposed to just the word doing what the word will do. So why is revivalism appealing? It's appealing because it appeals to our wrong thinking about our will and tells us that we have a role in our salvation, which we don't. We just don't. But we like that. We like having something to do, playing some role. Right? It's like if somebody has three minutes left to live, what do you do? Well, I ask forgiveness for my sin. See, so I'm saving myself by asking for to get rid of my sin instead of saying, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Because I can't do anything. It's up to you. I wish I had more time so I could. Yeah. Blah, 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 blah. And it takes the work of salvation off of Christ. That's the danger of it. Um, it doesn't. It may seem subtle, but it's, it's less than that. It takes the work of salvation off of Christ and puts it on our decision to be saved. So sometimes you could say it's semantics. They're just, you know, and this is one of the arguments that you'll get back from people as well. You're just, it's just semantics. I'm saying that I made a decision. You're saying Jesus saved me before I made a decision. It's just semantics. It's emphasis. Where's your emphasis? Your emphasis is on Christ. It's in the right place. If your emphasis is on yourself, it's in the wrong place. So when I ask the question, is any of that sin? That was a loaded question. I know. I believe it is sin. I know. I do too, but I just was waiting. Because I knew it was loaded. Jesus Christ and you will be saved. You shall have no other gods before me. And if I'm putting myself in front of God, yeah. I violated the first commandment. Yeah. And, and yeah. it's a subtle thing, but it's a huge thing. Yeah. And this is Ephesians, which we just mentioned a bit ago. And this, I think, is the last part. It says, but, when, but God, when rich, uh, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead, and dead people can't do anything. That's the thing. You, Focus on the right words when you're discussing scripture. Dead people are dead. They can't make themselves alive, right? Uh, he made us alive. When we were dead, he made us alive. It was his work. He, he, he run the ver ran the verbs, as they say. Um, by grace you have been saved. For by grace you have been saved. By grace you have been saved. By grace you have been saved. <laughs> Through faith. And this not of your own doing. It's a gift of God. A gift is not, you know, hey, give me a gift, Gary. And then it's not a gift. A gift is when you say, here, Chris, uh, not a result of work so that no one can boast. Uh, one of the flaws of American Christianity is it puts so much emphasis 
on the human will, on our own actions. And, um, and that is dangerous in a number of different ways. But the chief way that it's dangerous is that, um, is that it leads simply to boasting. I mean, the reason that I'm a Christian and that person is not a Christian is because of something that I did. And the gospel, being purely the work of God, excludes boasting. So we can see that, I mean, this is one of the ways to see if the gospel is being preached in its clarity and its fullness, is there room for boasting? If, if me becoming a Christian is an act of my own will, if it's something that I do and someone else refuses to do, then that, then that not only does it ex- not exclude boasting, it almost demands boasting. Uh, and so the, the gospel being purely the work of God, the grace of God, uh, the gift of God, p- purely his work, uh, leaves no room for that kind of pride. And, and also it leaves no room for that kind of despair. If my, if my Christian life is begun by me, uh, it's, th- then, then I, I have so much room for despair because I hardly do anything right. In fact, I can say pretty clearly that I never do anything right, that everything I do is stained with sin, bad motives, bad desires, uh, s- selfishness and pride and all of this sort of stuff. And it's no different with spiritual things. In fact, it's even worse. So, so it's a setup for danger, and and also it just plainly contradicts the scripture. Uh, Jesus says that it is God who grants repentance. We we are dead in our trespasses and sins. Uh, the the mind of the flesh cannot receive the things of the Spirit of God. All over the Bible talks about our incapacity to to do spiritually good things, and so we want to be very cognizant of that fact. So your, our friends, our Christian friends, are going to be in, are more in, are influenced by this, and we are too. We have to be honest with the fact that we're influenced by this too. Uh, we want to boast. We want to boast about stuff, um, uh, like saying, oh, "I didn't sin today. I, 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 I I'll, I'll, I'll confess tomorrow. I didn't, I didn't sin today." Well, mm-hmm. yeah, you did when you said you didn't sin today. <laughs> Anybody have any questions? Because Pastor Wolf Miller uh, uh, is open to me sending him questions uh, that can clarify anything that I made cloudy uh, or just questions you might have. Pastor Hillebrandt, one time after he was gone and he and I were together at a conference, he asked me how things were going to Trinity and asked me if I'm still doing the Saturday morning Bible study. And I said, yeah. And he said, those that that. He said, that those people need to get out there on a street corner. They need to, be, they need to get out of those classes and, and, and start winning the, winning the lost, wasting your time in those classes. And I went, uh, okay. You know, and I'm sure there was something that caused him to say that. I'm sure he went to some, you know. But the point is, you know, I don't believe it's as easy to be a Christian as, as people say. Because... My older brother will always say that when someone joined the church or went to adult instruction, he would say, now get ready, Satan's going to unload on you. You know, because he's going to make you doubt, he's going to make you jealous, he's going to make you, you know, and all that stuff is true. And all Satan's got to do is get you just a few degrees in the center. And, and this whole thing about, I've got to do something, that is just huge. Mm. Um, goodness sakes, yeah. Is it? But I want to say this. Okay. We can rejoice that I know Dell Winters is in heaven. I know it. I, I've heard his testimony. I, I, I've seen him through through good times and bad times and, and strong times. And I know he trusted the Savior. Mm. You know. So whatever that's worth. Totally he, he reminds me of what American Christianity used to be, or as you would say, old school Christianity. Mm. Dell did, yes. Yeah. He needs to get a Lutheran name. Wolf Mueller? Come yeah, on. I know, he's from Texas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If he was from Minnesota. I bet you a dollar German, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, speaking of Benny, I believe uh, Billy Graham and another Billy, Billy Sunday, weren't Billy they? Billy Sunday was uh, one. They were also followers of. Sure, because Billy Graham had a had a a, a a radio show called The Moment of Decision. 
or uh, it's like because and and I heard him preach a number of times, and I think Billy Graham's one of those people that started out more solid, um, very Calvinist and Baptist or whatever, but but still solid. And then over time, he kind of got a little more excited and stuff. And I, I heard him preaching one time, and he's like, "I'm not going to let y'all go until y'all make a decision." <laughs> <laughs> but point, his point, what, what works? You know? it's in Billy's in Billy's life. How can you doubt when you've got 20,000 people walking forward? You've got to believe you're doing the right thing. So that's what defines American Christianity. But you should have stopped right there and said, yeah. that's because the Holy Spirit motivated you to be here. You didn't do this thing on your own. Right. You know, all you're point doing people is following the, the promptings of the Holy Spirit in your life. If you, then it would be all right. You point people to Christ. The Holy Spirit points people to Christ. You don't point people to yourself. You don't take credit for anybody's salvation. Anyway, um, so if are there any questions? If not, we'll, we'll pray. But um, Pastor Wolf Miller may even do a video response if you have a question. So you can email me. Or text. Okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this great day. We thank you, Lord, for uh, the uh, willingness to look honestly at the American church and ourselves and, and, and be sure, Lord, that we're keeping the main thing the main thing, that we're not pointing people to themselves or to us, but we're pointing them to you. Uh, and we thank you for the lesson today. Thank you for joining us for this Bible study on Has American Christianity Failed? I'm Chris with Cafe Sola. I hope you learned a lot. I hope you learned a lot about revivalism and uh, about Finney. And if you're curious about that thing that was raised earlier in the class where the gentleman mentioned the plot, focusing on the plot, that'll more than likely be addressed in the next class as opposed to uh, just letting it lie there. I sent that a concern to Pastor Wolf Miller, and he responded with a video reply. So that will be included in either the next class or the one after that. So please stay tuned and come on back. As always, remember to like it wherever you need to like it. There's always a way to like things out there, whether it's the little heart or the thumbs up. And follow Cafe Sola on Facebook, and that way you'll get notified through Facebook when a new episode of this Bible study is posted. You can also subscribe on YouTube and hit the notification bell, and you can subscribe also on your podcast app. If you're following uh, this Bible study on your podcast app, please subscribe to the RSS feed or to the um, the channel or whatever they call it there, and you'll be able to get all the notifications as to when new classes drop. And also remember to share, because these kind of things, not saying... Um, anything about myself, particularly as a teacher, but this book needs to be out there. So this Bible study needs to be out there. And I just ask you to, to share and share alike. Share with your friends, invite people, and tune in next time as we continue to study. I believe we touch on pietism next week and maybe another ism, and we'll see how far we go. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Christopher Hogan. This has been Cafe Sola's Bible Study on Has American Christianity Failed? And we will talk with you soon. God's blessings on your day. Thank you for joining us for this Bible study on Pastor Brian Wolfmuller's book, Has American Christianity Failed? For more from Christopher Hogan and Cafe Sola, go to cafesola.com.